Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Friday Fellowship. I'm really glad that you could all be here with us tonight or whenever it is that you're watching this. Uh, it's been quite a week. Hope you're doing well and have made it through the week okay. I know for many of us, we're anticipating what looks to be a pretty wild week next week. Um, like a lot of you, I'm a fan of, of Stephen Colbert and I was watching um, his show from last night. He mentioned a statistic, which I found um, also, I guess, reported by thehill.com that said that 68% of Americans, regardless of political party, are experiencing some form of serious stress um, when they think about next week and what's going to come along. So just want to recognize that that's our reality right now and that by this time next week when we do Friday Fellowship, who knows what we'll be talking about um, uh, and, and all the side things that may be going on as well as the, obviously the major stories of the day and the election. So just want you to know that we're with you and we're all here with each other and that this is something that we can be bringing to God as we always do, uh, bringing our concerns and our problems and as well as our joys and our celebrations. And so um, as we move into a moment of reflection right now and making ourselves present to God, I want to invite you to bring whatever burdens um, from the present or from this past week or from next week uh, that you may have on your mind and bring those before God and just open yourself to God during this time. Hello everyone, welcome to Claremont Christian Fellowship, Friday Fellowship. My name is Paris, I'm a third year at Pitzer. I've been involved with CCF since my first year and I'm so excited to MC uh, for the third time in the semester tonight. But of course, I like to start it off with a few announcements. So of course, our good old after fellowship hangout Join us on Zoom. Um, the link will be on CCS Facebook page, um, the Messenger chat, or in uh, CCS weekly emails. The activity tonight is watching vampires. Hey, Paris. We seem to be, have lost your audio. What? Um, oh, you know what? It's because we dropped it on our side. My bad. I bet everyone can hear you, and it was just me that couldn't hear you. So whatever you're saying right now, please keep it up, okay? <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, no. No, no. Okay. Okay, good. So uh, all of y'all should all be all good. We love technology. Uh, so, so yeah, Vampires vs. the Bronx uh, movie screening tonight. So join us for that. Um, next up, we'll have workout with Matt. Always Saturday afternoon, specific standard time, 1 to 2.30 p.m. I'm still in recovery from the one Chloe Ting ab workout that I did, but y'all have fun. Y'all have fun. Um, and of course, to top it all off, tomorrow is Halloween, spooky time. Ooh. So Pitzer's community group is hosting um, a really cool costume party, but it won't just be a costume party. Of course, it'll be costume contest. There'll be a scavenger hunt. It'll be a Halloween themed Kahoot game, charades whole lot going on fun things fun things and maybe like an escape room or a game of among us or one night werewolf to finish it all off so that will be at three o'clock specific standard time tomorrow so come out to the part horror as Ra Ra would say um, yes <laughs> hi everyone I'm Lorraine so our series called Practices for Self-Quarantines uh, has been really great so far. Last week, Connie Whitwood talked about when prayer is hard. 
and I recommend going back and watching it if you haven't yet. Next week, our very own Chris Harry will continue our series as he speaks on healing our academic lives. Tonight, we have the privilege of hearing from Dr. Jessica Chenfeng. Jessica is a licensed therapist and the author of Finding Your Voice as a Beginning Marriage and Family Therapist. Her doctoral research focused on issues of race, gender, spirituality, and power within relationships. Currently, she works at Loma Linda University Health as Associate Director of Physician Vitality and Associate Professor in the School of Medicine. She identifies as a second-generation Taiwanese-American and lives in Montclair, California with her husband and preschool son. We are so thankful to have had Jessica speak for us twice in the last year and to have her again with us tonight. Welcome, Jessica, and thank you so much for being with us. All right. Thanks for having me. This is really cool. I have not used this interface before. Welcome to our master bedroom. Uh, we, we're in a two bedroom, like condo apartment. And so any moment now, my husband and toddler are going to get home. And this is my way of avoiding um, the chaos. So um, yeah, it's it's an honor to be here with you all. I know we're, we're chatting with folks from across the states, locally, internationally. So whenever you get a chance to join in, it'll be great to have you. So yes, this is the title of what we'll talk about tonight, Work and Rest in a Year Like 2020, right? Here we are, we're entering November this weekend, and I don't know where the year has gone. And we'll talk a little bit about our sense of time. So um, yeah, you could go to the next slide. We'll talk about what is the impact of this year. Um, you heard from Lorraine, I'm a trained family therapist. The majority of my work is around mental health issues, wellness issues as it pertains in my full-time job to the physician life. But really outside of my formal work, um, a lot of what I do and care about is for the church. So how does mental health and wellness um, intersect with the church? And how can we better support ourselves and our communities um, of faith? So then we'll talk about some areas of wellness we can all reflect on. And then we'll end with a revisioning life. Next slide. Okay, so let's talk about a sense of time. Um, so this year, right, we... Essentially, from pretty much the start, I mean, I don't know about you all, but I was born and raised in L.A., so we started off the year with a really tragic death, right, with Kobe Bryant's death and his daughter and um, their friends in the helicopter. And there have been a number of significant deaths this year. But um, soon after that, we had our pandemic that began. And so from, from the very start, we've been dealing with not knowing what the future is going to be like. And um, when we don't know what the future is, we tend to live in the present moment. Now, the challenge is our present moment has had a lot of distress and it's been nonstop. It's like a constant barrage coming through the news. Um, I, I don't know what your experience was like, and I'm sure as college students, those of you who were in college at the time physically, you have to figure out like what's going on with this public health crisis. Do I go home? Can I stay? And then I know the colleges had decided to shut down. So um, all of this constant distress then leaves our brain asking, what day is it? Right? Like what's going on? Um, it's this term called temporal disintegration. And it's actually what happens when we are in experiencing depression as well. So if you're feeling um, you know, in a bout of major depression, it's normal for your brain to have a hard time registering like what, what time of day is it? What day of the week is it? And so I know many people kind of you know, half-heartedly joked about, yeah, what day of the week is it? There are all those memes early in, in the year. Now, Part of why we lose track of time is because we're questioning what is going to happen in the future. And this has been constant. Um, I know many of us probably thought, okay, let's give it one or two months, right? I had to take my son out of childcare um, in you know, mid-March and it's like, okay, how long are we going to do this 
work full time from home while parenting full time thing. Um, and it just kept going and it's continued to go. And so um, that is not how our brain typically is used to engaging with the world and with our sense of time. So just wanting to normalize, you know, for those of us who've just been very um, disoriented, uh, it's, it's just a function of what has happened this year. Next slide. Okay, so I wanted to talk a bit about chronic versus acute stress. So um, you might be familiar with, you know, something acute is a one-time incident. A great example is this week, my sister's family, they live down in Irvine. They had to evacuate their home because of the, the Silverado fire that was literally across the street, um, starting in the hills right behind them. So they had to evacuate. They came to our house for a day and then stayed in a hotel for two, three more days. Um, it, it was very stressful, um, but that is considered a, a general acute situation. Um, and it happened this week. It was somewhat resolved. Um, you know, time will tell if it will be ongoing, right? If the Santa Ana winds this weekend will make it worse. But all of it to say that's generally an acute traumatic situation. Now, when we're talking about this year, our brain is not thinking about 2020 as acute stress. This has now become chronic stress for just about every person, I think, on planet Earth. Um, and, I, and here, I'm just going to review like some of the things. There's many more than what's on here, but the number of things that we are carrying, being faced with, getting stressed out. Um, so let's see, we have fear about our health. Um, first there's illness with COVID. And then there were deaths. I Some of us here probably have experienced death with family members, with people that you love or people who were seriously ill. So then along with that is grief. Um, and then we have public health concerns and all of the stress around what's helpful, what's not helpful, what can lead to protecting myself and those I care about, what's not. Um, and then, of course, all the political discourse around public health concerns. And then there's uncertainty, right? People, you know, every time the numbers get better and then they get worse again and then things get reopened and then, then we have to backtrack. And so it's been nonstop. Of course, there's the drastic increase of anti-Asian racism related to the pandemic. Um, there are lots of health inequities, uh, communities of color, particularly black and brown communities um, at much more risk uh, with the pandemic. And then related to all of that, we have physical space issues like you have to stay home. You, you can't go out to eat. You can't go to a park even. They've been closed, and, and at least in LA just until recently. Um, you avoid your neighbors. You avoid people on the street. It's a, it's a weird shift. And so feeling displaced physically, some of you had to move out of your dorms or wherever you were staying. Um, and, and I know some of other college students I know, they're moving back to a very difficult family situation. It's stressful. There's a lot of people who live in the house. They have younger siblings. So those things cause a lot of stress and potential tension. Um, and then, you know, we just to even begin talking about social and relational changes. This is loaded. It's huge. You know, as people, and I know your generation probably grew up a bit more on, on media platforms than other generations. But nonetheless, you know, all of us are zoomed out. We were not meant to be keeping our eyes focused on a screen, not having our mirror neurons activated, you know, because of human, the lack of human connection. And so, you know, things like dating even, hanging out with friends, um, giving and receiving hugs, right? Those are major human needs that in this season of life, they're, they, they've been compromised. And so 
Um, there's also some stuff in the data, I don't know if you've come across it in your reading, but because families are quarantined together, they're sort of stuck in smaller spaces, spouses are not going to work, they don't have eight plus hours a day on their own, there's increased marital distress in the homes. There's actually even increased um, child abuse, um, intimate partner abuse as a result of heightened stress within the home. So there's a lot that we could talk about, but we can understand that there are major social consequences to um, this year. Now, apart from COVID, there's also constant natural disasters, right? We have West Coast ones with our fire seasons. We have hurricanes in the South and the East. Um, there have been earthquakes, uh, pretty major ones this year. And of course, uh, BLM and all the racial injustice that is ongoing this year and has increased in its um, aware people's awareness, the uprisings, um, and, and all the ways that whether we're physically at the protests, um, directly involved, care deeply about it, and we're witnessing it, um, have close family or friends who are part of these communities and all of it is distressing and and seeing the ways that it, it plays out in the political sphere um with uh police i mean there's just a lot and so um th that is a type of stress that for of course communities of color this is only a major add-on and every day depending on what your life experience is if you're encountering racism when you go pick up food um, it can just continue to get exacerbated. Um, I can't, you know, don't even want to begin to talk about the political distress, especially as we're entering election week, but it's been constant. And um, there's a whole lot I could say about why, you know, the president and various people like to hijack our mental health uh, ruminations around politics. Um, but but that has been present for a number of years, but this year in particular. Um, financial distress for many people, right? Loss of jobs, I'm sure people here have family members or those that you love who've been impacted. Um, changes in work circumstances, getting furloughed, all, all of those options. Um, and then of course, spirit, spiritual distress. You know, I think when we're, when our brains are in this like chronic, stress mode, it's in survival mode. So oftentimes we're, we're barely meeting our basic needs, let alone thinking about our spiritual needs, right? And so even with, so some of us have space and time to think about it, but others, there's just this general sense of like, where is God? Like, how does this year make sense in terms of who I understand God to be? Um, what life is about, you know, how you even make plans for your life, all of those sort of things. The, the normal trajectory, you know, especially of a college student is you're in college primarily to focus on your studies, learn about yourself, grow, develop relationships, connect with people, you know, mature, and then hopefully figure out what it is that you want to study and then move on, graduate, and go to the next stage of your life. But so many of those um, expected markers of life are, are kind of uncertain. And so oftentimes we kind of rest our spiritual walk and our connection to God based on these time markers. But when they're not there, it also throws off that spiritual connection and awareness. And so anyways, I know this is not a very happy slide at all. This is a very sad, distressing slide, but I think it's, for me at least, I think it's important and helpful to really face what a crazy, unfortunate, terrible, there are other words I wanna use, year that 2020 has been so far and why it's it's making it hard for many of us to carry about life in, in the way that we typically would want to. And next slide, please. All right, so those of you who've heard me speak before, I've referenced this, but I wanna briefly mention what happens to the brain when we're chronically stressed. 
So in the middle, you have this window of tolerance. Basically, in a year not like 2020, or maybe in a season of life where you're doing generally well, most of us will have periods where we live out of this window of tolerance. It's our optimal arousal zone. You know, something stressful comes into your day and, and your brain can integrate it and say, you know what, it's okay. I'm not gonna get upset. I'm gonna respond to this person, let them know what I'm thinking. It's okay, let's move on with life. But this is not one of those years. Um, most of us have been pushed out of our window of tolerance into hyper and hypo arousal zones. So hyper arousal is your classic anxiety, right? Your fight or flight response when, when you're thinking of, about a lot of things, you're emotionally reactive. You know, I don't know about you, but these days it's like uh, I get one too many requests from my family from work and I'm just upset. I get easily irritated. Okay. Um, by the way, sorry, there, there is my child. Mom, uh, Andre. <laughs> Okay, I'm so sorry, everyone. Um, now we have a crying baby. But um, we all get pushed out of our window of tolerance into these hyper and hypo arousal zones. So this is a great example. I'm actually in a decent space today, but if I were any more agitated, um, it's very possible. Like I could get upset with my son. Um, it would be hard for me to like transition back to this conversation, but um, so hyper arousal is more your classic anxiety, and then hypo arousal is where you're sort of numb, right? You're emotionally checked out, you've been thinking, ruminating, overwhelmed so much that you're just tired. And at the end of the day, you want to just zone out on Netflix. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was perfectly timed. Um, and you, you don't wanna do anything. And I think this year, because of the chronic stress on our brains, we are constantly fluctuating between hyper and hypo arousal. And the longer we stay there, which is normal, it makes it hard to go back into the window of tolerance. So all of it to say, you know, this is hopefully a helpful way to understand the brain can only tolerate so much stress. And so if you find yourself like me, easily irritable, I, sometimes I cry really easily. Like, you know, my work day is really full. There's so much going on and this one thing happens or I watch something on news and I just start crying. And I'm like, what is going on with me? So if you find yourself asking, you know, yourself, what's going on with me? It's a good time to, to be compassionate to ourselves and think, you know what, my brain is maxed out. I am in hyper and hypo arousal. Let's see what sort of things I can do to support how I'm feeling. All right, next slide. All right, so I actually kind of mentioned the, these things already. So when we have chronic stress on our brains, essentially our brain is more vulnerable. So if you have like an acute trauma happen, and then another one happens the next week, and something else happens the next month, your brain is in a vulnerable state. It does not have time to repair, to heal, to even integrate those encounters into the larger story. That is kind of what's happened with 2020, where it's sort of one thing after another without much time to repair, and so it makes our brains particularly vulnerable to any ongoing stress. And so I mentioned here, when you live outside of the window of tolerance for a long period of time, it's much harder to return to it. So what our brains are all doing this year is we're being hypervigilant. Um, like in, in the case of my family with the increased anti-Asian racism, you know, we're very concerned when we go out. I'm always anticipating, okay, what if someone says this to our family? Um, I, in the last week, I had two incidents of my they they are not explicit, but um, I think race related incidents in public, um, feeling overprotective of yourselves and your families, overworked for sure, 
And your brain is constantly searching for something to arrive at, some way to find rest, um, but then it doesn't really come, or if it does, it's fleeting. And so all these things I mentioned previously, being irritable, you're emotional, you're checked out, numb, angry, volatile, feeling isolated, your mental health symptoms have increased in this season. I just want to normalize all of this, that all of us in some form or another, if you're encountering this, you have a healthy brain. You are a human being, and we're all in this together. Okay, next slide. I wanted to briefly share uh, data from the CDC. I know not all of us know exactly how to trust the CDC, but I think some of this data seems reliable here. So essentially in the last week of June, 2020, they did a national survey and this is what they found about mental health. So there was at least one adverse mental health or behavioral health symptom reported by, so in your age range, right, 18 to 24 years old, about 75% of people reported having at least one adverse mental health symptom. That That's a lot. So like three quarters of you here right now uh, most likely are facing something distressing. The 25 to 44 year old range, half of people. Those who have less than a high school diploma, 66%. And we can guess it could be due to like financial strain, loss of work, um, lower socioeconomic status, uh, so on and so forth. Of course, um, our essential workers of all kinds, 54%. And then those who are caring for um, adults and they're unpaid. So these are our communities that have the highest, you know, adverse mental health symptom reporting. And then during that week, 40% of US adults, this is across all of the United States, reported struggling with mental health or substance abuse. And these are the changes. 31% increase in anxiety or depression. 13% started or increased their substance use. 26% had trauma or stress-related symptoms. And 11% have seriously considered suicide. So I, I, I don't mean for this to be a downer, but sometimes it's helpful to see the data and realize, wow, more than one out of 10 people living in the United States who are representative of this population have seriously considered suicide. That is how hard this year has been in our country on all of us. And so um, just thinking about your life circumstances in light of that, I think is really important. All right, next slide. So, um, I know there's a bit of a delay, but if you are able, you know, what have you noticed about yourself in terms of how this year has affected your sense of self and well-being? So I know there's this chat function here. So take a moment, um, think about it. What have you noticed about yourself, right? How is it affecting you, who you know yourself to be, how you typically function? Um, hopefully it's helpful to like share with each other and to resonate with one another. Um, I know I know for me, one of the things I learned and realized is that um, I really am impacted by my sense of space. And when my space is in disarray, like it's very hard for me to focus and I'm easily agitated if if that space feels um, cluttered, overwhelming, um, all of those sorts of things. So if you feel like it's helpful, you know, please share a chat discussion about how you notice yourself being affected. All right, next slide. All right, so I don't know if you hear my son screaming my name. Um, I'll, and I'll check back in on, on the chats as people um, say something. Okay, so... This is actually um, something from, you know, I'm so sorry. Can, give me a split second. Okay, I'm very distracted. Hold on.
Okay, I'm so sorry. I did not know my husband stepped out, and so my son was alone. Okay, um, thanks for your understanding. <laughs> yes, this is totally the stress of our family. You get to experience why this lecture is very much for me as it is for, I hope, you. So um, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration, um, they came up with these eight uh, factors of wellness, right? And um, there are these eight things here, and I just wanted to share them with you because before I saw this, I didn't really think about these eight elements. And sometimes it's just helpful to sort of personally assess, like, you know, how am I doing in these areas? So of course, we have physical health, right? Physical well-being in terms of what you're taking in nutritionally. Is it food that's nourishing for your body and your brain? How is your body doing in terms of movement, rest, and sleep? Oftentimes, uh, physical symptoms are a good indicator of our well-being. I know for me, it's been impossible to do like exercise like I normally used to. So I, between my work meetings, I'm, I'm literally taking 10-minute walks like two, three times a day um, just to get out of my chair, off of the computer. Um, you know, that's something I've been doing. Emotional mental health. Right? The level of stress, your ability to be present, um, how are your coping skills? There's, of course, our social relational. We talked a little bit about that. Your sense of belonging, um, connection to people, family and friends and colleagues. And then there's the intellectual, right? This usually sometimes, I mean, you're a student, so it, is, so it may be different. But when we're in crisis mode, sometimes feeding our intellectual need kind of is it goes out the window. It's less important. But things like creativity, expanding knowledge and skills. So in the early part of the quarantine, I actually picked up sewing. I started sewing my own clothes. I really enjoyed that. And then there's been this, and then I've been baking a lot of bread at home. And one thing I'm hoping to pick up is knitting because I found that like my work life, family life, it sometimes just I'm functioning too much out of my window of tolerance, and so I need to do something creative, and my background is in the creative arts. Occupational or school academic, right? Are you feeling satisfaction from, from your schooling, your education? Of course, financial, this can always be a strain and a stress, right? Satisfaction with your current situation, your family situation. Um, environmental, I mentioned this a little bit. Um, your your space, um, how is it in terms of digital clutter even, right? Sometimes um, I'm referring even to social media use. Sometimes that can be overwhelming, how often you're reading news, how it affects you. Um, there could be literal like electronic magnetic radiation um, and frequencies that affect us. If you have devices around you all the time, it's going to impact your sleep. Um, your well-being. And then, of course, lastly, spiritual, right? Um, in this season of life, where are you in terms of your sense of purpose, right? Are you feeling like there is even a sense of purpose? Um, what does your faith community look like? Do you feel like you're able to connect with something greater, even though there's so much going on? All right, so just quickly skimming here. Okay, so yes. Oh, working a lot more than usual. Yes, heartburn. This is interesting. Working with physicians, I've had a lot of people tell me they've gotten heartburn for the first time in their lives, as well as people who've experienced panic attacks. Not that they are related, but just for the first time this year, those are just common symptoms. Yes, anxiety, which can just flip us out any time. Exhaustion, decreased, decreased motivation for sure. Um, yes, a lot more burnt out. Great. You know, I'm going to send um, Chris and Lorraine. There's a really great series on burnout of, of YouTube video series. And so that might help some of you. Um, burnout is, is very common this year. And, and there are subtle differences between burnout and depression. And so it might help to, to um, learn about that. All right, next slide. So yes, I appreciate those who've been able to participate. If you want to, give yourself a quick self-assessment along those eight areas. And then you can put in the chat, share about one area you've been doing 
better in. It doesn't have to be well, but maybe one of your higher rated areas and another area that you'd like to focus on for growth. And sometimes this is helpful to know. It's like, you know, as you, as friends, as people in this community together, you can encourage one another, give each other ideas for um, how to work on you know, some of those areas. All right, next slide. So just moving toward this last section of revisioning life, right? So, you know, we're really encountering here, oh my gosh, 2020 is a lot. It's, it's too much. It's not just a lot, it's really been too much. And so in order to compensate for the uncertainty and disorientation, life really re requires much more flexibility and breathing room. And we have to intentionally plan space to recover. So you know, prior to this year, our ebb and flow of work, of studying, of rest, you might have found something that works for you. Maybe you're good at like pushing yourself really hard during the week and then, you know, you rest really well at night or, you know, over the weekend. But whatever that ebb and flow was prior to all of this chronic stress, each of us has to rethink what has been working for me this year. What is continuing to add to my living and hyper and hypo arousal? We have to really revisit that. And even myself, right? You know, I've, I've been, I, I've known myself my whole life. I, I've got the system of life down, you know, full-time working parent, um, all of these things. But every, so much has switched up this year that it was several months into my work when I realized like, I'm burnt out. I don't typically feel burnt out this easily. And what is it that I need to do to change up my day and my week so that this is sustainable? Because the reality is we don't know when there is going to be a return to life as we previously knew it, right? It will be different. And so I can't anticipate the same life prior to 2020. I have to adapt and adjust. If I don't, my brain is, is not going to be doing well over an extended period of time. Uh, next slide. So, so this is sort of the, the last slide here. And these are simply options and possibilities for all of us, okay, things to think about. And as I go through this, if there's anything that catches your eye, you know, my encouragement to you is maybe just pick one thing to do, to focus on uh, moving forward. So first is do not pack your schedule. And even if your schedule is really busy, plan time for breaks. And so, um, you know, because the nature of my work is such that I have an online scheduler and, and med students and doctors can go online and just uh, sign up for a time to meet with me. If I leave it wide open, it gets completely packed and I will not get a lunch break, a bathroom break or, you know, any of those things. And so now I only make myself available like two hours at a time. And so I have breaks to eat, use the restroom, breathe you know, relax a little bit, but it's critical to make sure that you're actually planning rest time during your day. Second is finding regular times to be in nature. And I see um, Chris here saying getting lots of walks. Yes, it is so, so important to be in nature. And I don't know if you've been reading studies on how vitamin D, um, I think something like 80% of COVID patients lack vitamin D. And so one of the best ways to get vitamin D is in the middle of the day to be out under the sun with like a t-shirt or shorts on or any way where your skin can be exposed to the sun. Um, it, it's great and very important for our physical health, but really for our mental health, right? Oftentimes when we're in nature, it's hard not to be present. I know we take our son to the garden and we see, oh, there's a little squirrel running by, or you notice this really beautiful tree, and you feel the breeze on your face. Um, that's a, a natural context for your brain to be compelled to be in the present. It's not um, thinking about the future, worried about the past, and so nature is so healing for us. Third is, you know, assessing and planning for social connection. I know, you know, it's so great. You have these weekly um, meetings and they're, they're saved for you. You can watch it later. Um, but 
you know, even if it's virtual, planning for it so that your brain knows, okay, there's some, I get to hang out with my good friend or I get to quote unquote see or talk to my partner, whatever it might be. Um, it's so important to, to have social connection to look forward to. Fourth, like I kind of mentioned this, focus on the present. So mindfulness practice. Um, you know, those of you, actually as a student, Headspace is a wonderful app for mindfulness practice. If you haven't yet started mindfulness practice, you need support. Um, it's, it's $10 a year for students. Um, but if you live in LA County, it's free to you, uh, the subscription. There's a few other ways you can get it for free. Um, it's worth looking into, but it's, it's so great to start engaging in mindfulness because as I mentioned, when your brain is chronically stressed, it's usually future orientation. It's like anxiety, worried about what's coming. It's hard to feel settled. And so all the neural pathways in your brain are compelling you to more stress activation. But when we practice mindfulness regularly and we do deep breathing and we focus on the present, your brain is establishing new neural pathways that allow for true rest and true nourishment. Oh, awesome. Calm is free through Pomona College. That's great. Calm is one of the other really great mindful mindfulness apps. So thank you, Renee, for sharing that. Number five, adjust your expectations of self and others. I think I can't emphasize this enough to all of you high achieving Claremont College students. Um, all of us are recognizing, I don't know about you, I like easily forget things these days, or I'm upset that my husband forgot something I asked him to do, um, or you know, all kinds of situations. And so um, if you didn't do as well on an exam as you hope to, or whatever it is, recognizing that our performance, our abilities, all of that everything is warped this year. And so adjusting your expectations, I don't mean lowering them. I just mean being fair with ourselves, right? What is an appropriate expectation given circumstances? And so um, that's important to intentionally think about um, because it can really support our relationships or not. And number six, make your regular working space a happy space. This is important to me. For some people, it could be less important. But you know, if you have a little space in your house or wherever you're you're at, and and you have to work there, sleep there, eat there, whatever it is, make it enjoyable. Get a little plant that you can watch. You know, watch grow and change. Um, those things are simple but important uh, delights of life. Number seven, expand compassion and self-compassion. And this is similar to number five. You know, there, was, there are ebbs and flows in family life. And there was a season I was like easily irritated with my husband. And so a phrase I learned to, to say to myself is, it's okay, everyone is doing their best. It's okay, everyone is doing their best. And um, I had to repeat that so that I could be compassionate toward him, but also to myself, because this is when we had our son at home, I had to maintain my work, and it was just really hard. And so all of us need extra compassion and grace this, this season. And then lastly, it's just this general idea of acceptance. And I do mean that broadly. I think it's easy, you know, we get worked up if you're watching or reading news or you read about something with a friend on social media. And anytime we get irritated or reactive um, or we're worried about something, just to notice it, just to accept like, okay, I'm really worried about this and that's okay. This is just where I'm at not to fight it, not to wish it away, not to ignore it. Sometimes it's just acknowledging this is how I'm feeling and this is where I'm at and that's it. Um, so these are just some ideas for how we can all recalibrate and this will be ongoing, um, but we're in it together. Um, I think most of all, it's sometimes hard to remember, but God is right here with us. And um, whatever it is we need support in, um, God is embracing us, holding us, leading the way, uh, carrying us in whatever way that we need. I think the last slide, Chris, you can go there, is just my contact info. 
So some of you might have this already, but you are welcome to email me if there are other resources I can provide you. Even things like, um, you know, get, getting therapy, even if you're in another state, if there's any way I can reach out to my community of, of colleagues um, to find support for you, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, but yeah, uh, this is the end of this presentation. I'm sorry, I hope I didn't go too long. But And I don't know if this is a, a good space to have questions, but you're always welcome to email me and ask me anything follow-up. So um, Chris or Lorraine, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you so much, um, Jessica. We really appreciate that word. It's a good word. And I think a lot of us can just benefit from having all kinds of resources right now. And um, I know one trap that so many of us, at least I fall into, is um, just kind of going with the day-to-day, -day, sort of like just surviving and not really stepping back to ask that question, except when I'm having like a moment of crisis, but not really stepping back to ask the question of um, what can I do differently or is there a way to be proactive in my thinking and in my self-care and how I'm bringing, um, how I'm looking to God and to community and others and to just the things I know are true of me. Um, in order to um, bring change and stay um, focused on how I want to approach the situation. It's a lot. I appreciate the eight things. I'm going to put the slide back up here with these things. Um, these are really important for us. Uh, and what I want to invite us to do right now is as we are um, uh, moving into a time of just a little reflection and response, you know, in a moment I'll share um, another video, a uh, worship response um, led by Eric Lige, who um, made these available to us. Um, but uh, before and as we go into that, I'd like you to really think about these things. What is um, on here that could be an area where, where you see weakness? Um, uh, maybe if you're not sure, um, uh, stop and ask God, like, um, uh, what kind of what self care do I need right now? Um, what's going to really help me in this? For me, when I look at this list, I'm looking at it right now. Um, uh, I feel like there's some things that have been, I've been doing well with. Um, and then others, not that we judge ourselves on how well we're doing, but I see others where I'm like, oh, that would really help. And the one that stands out to me a lot is that one number five right now about adjusting expectations. I've just been really hard on myself lately. Um, kind of, um, uh, always tempted to feel like I'm not doing enough or I'm not handling this well enough. Um, I'm not handling life well enough, uh, the big questions of life, and then beginning to beat myself up and be and going into an anxious spiral. And um, I think this is really important to me, this adjusting expectations um, and then having self-compassion, which um, we'll, we're, we're blessed to have Sigrika, who will be um, in a couple of weeks sharing um, her thoughts in one of these Friday Fellowship messages um, on that exact um, thought. So we'll be coming back to these things the next couple of weeks and thinking about how we um, can really experience the freedom and love and peace that are supposed to be ours um, through God um, and how we can step more into them than we have been already. But I'm going to move us now um, into a time of reflection response. And so as we do that, Let's be thoughtful about this. And then it'd be great if you would share um, one way, one takeaway that you have from this message. Without you 
in my life Use me for your glory Oh Lord, how I need you by my side Send your anointing Father, I pray And while you're sending Please show me the way back to your heart, oh God. Make me more and more like you. Holy, devoted to your will. I need you, Holy Spirit. Can make it without you in my life. Use me for your glory, oh Lord, how I need you by my side. I need you, Holy Spirit, can make it without you in my life. You for your glory, oh Lord, how I need you by my side. Send your anointing, Father, I pray. And while you're sending, please show me the way back to your heart, oh God. Make me more and more like you, holy devoted to your will. Oh, 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 yeah. Oh, 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 yeah. I need you every hour. Can't make it, make it without you I need you in my life Yes, I do I need you every hour Can't make it, make it without you I need you in my life Lord, I need you every hour can make and make it without you I need you in my life I need you every hour can make it without you Jesus I need you in my life yeah yeah I need you every hour can make it, make it without you. I need you in my life. Oh. Hello, everyone. Thank you again for joining us for our today's Friday Fellowship. Join us at the After Fellowship Hangout. The Zoom link is on CCS Facebook page and in the Facebook Messenger chat. Hope everyone has a really, really good weekend and a good week next week, no matter what happens. Um, I suggest taking a social media break. I know I am next week. So 